I made a comment earlier tonight that uh, I guess uh, went out over the air that I am deeply ashamed of. If I have hurt anyone out there, I can't tell you how much I say from the bottom of my heart, I'm so very, very sorry. I pride myself and think of myself as a, a man of faith, as there's a drive in a deep left field by Castellanos, it will be a home run. Play ball! Yeah! What's up, fudge packers? Ciao, fudge packers. Welcome to Pierre Boys Podcast. Got a mouthful of banana bread this morning. Uh, oh, and welcome to the n- bottom of the ninth of spring training. I'm Adam, and you're in. And I'm Steve, and I'm ready to play ball. It's the end of spring training. The uh, warming up is over. It's time to get into the real season. And what a real season of summer we have for you. (sighs) Oh, boy. Next week's episode. Next week is kicking off May and uh, very excited for what we have planned for May. Maybe Maybe not what you're expecting, but that's next week's excitement. No, but uh, I'm very excited. Uh, It's tough to see baseball uh, in the rearview mirror, uh, but we're so filled with Erm to uh, give you what you're going to get. What a full count, bases loaded, home run of a movie we're watching this week because we're capping off spring training with 1994's Angels in the Outfield. Of course we were going to do this movie. It's the perfect movie for spring training. It's got angels. It's got baseball. It's got Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It's got everything. I already love it. Yes, I already love it. <laughs> I, I think full count is the pinnacle of filmmaking when it comes to sports media. But uh, Angels in the Outfield, I mean, what an epic way to end and uh, truly see some godly inspiration. Yeah, I mean, this movie is exactly what you would hope from, like, a religious baseball movie and that there is just god magic all over this thing. This thing is soaked in god magic. And uh, boy, oh boy, do, uh, well, do we get the most of it out of Angels in the Outfield, 1994. But before we get into all of the excitement of god cheating to help a team win a baseball game, we need to, of course, do the pure boy's prayer. God God bless bless our our podcast. podcast. God God bless bless all all podcasts. podcasts. We We love you. Amen. Amen. You're an amen. I'm an amen. Yeah, well, or as Joseph Gordon-Levitt would say, oh, and also a woman. (laughs) JGL coming in hot. What a cute uh, little button. What a fat little kid he was. (laughs) (laughs) He's got chubby cheeks, but uh, yeah. He's a little chubster. Yeah, I mean, he's... You know, he's uh, he doesn't have the jowls of a Danny Glover, but he's uh, you know, a little chubby little chipmunk kid. <laughs> he's trying, though. They probably injected some kind of fluid into his cheeks to get him to look kind of like Danny Glover. <laughs> Certainly. Oh, yeah. They said, can you just, like, jiggle your face a lot? And he was like, no problem. <laughs> For some reason during this film, all I could think of uh, is the kid that came second to JGL and how heart crushing it must be to like almost become the most famous person in the world right yeah anyone who any the anyone who didn't get this role could have then gone on to be in third rock from the sun could have gone on to be in the dark knight rises and the rest looper i got to <laughs> mention <Luper. laughs> oh got to mention looper playing a young bruce willis when he still had you know life in his heart what a what a beautiful movie yeah, he got four surgeries for that film. As he should, and it was worth it. That movie, that fool me is a masterpiece. <laughs> yeah, fool me once, shame on you. Hey, watch Looper. Travel back in time, shoot me in the face, <laughs> shame on me. <laughs> that was the tagline for the film. I had a fun experience at that movie. I went with a mutual friend of ours, friend of the show, fan of the show, Dave, and uh, we went to go see that movie and. Like halfway through it, he had to go take a squirt, so he left the theater like right at the like right at the best part of the movie. He went to the bathroom, and then like the whole scene in the farmhouse happened, where there's all the slow mo and stuff, and like oh yeah, and then he came back like as soon as it was done, and after the movie, he was like, yeah, it was okay, and I'm like, you missed the best part, like literally, it was like incredible. <laughs> he didn't care. 
He didn't care. He's a hater. He's a hater. He's a masturbator, which is why I went to the washroom during the best scene of the movie. Of course. He saw young Bruce Willis, and he was like, you got a nut, and he just ran out of there. <laughs> I'm sorry to call him a masturbator, yeah, especially a on this godly podcast, but I call him the way I see it. <laughs> well, Dave, we're so sorry to <laughs> put you on blast <laughs> and to slander your name like this. We love you so much, and please come back on the show to talk about Sister Act 3 whenever it hits Disney+. Plus. Yeah, and stop uh, starting to choke that chicken. That's right. Uh, and yeah. fully commit yeah. to choking that chicken. Please. Yeah, stop starting and just go through with it. Get over it. Nice, nice. Hey, you know, it saddens <laughs> me to say, but I have a very important question to ask you for the last time, Steve. Mm -hmm. And of course, that question is... Whomst was the Roberto Alomar of A League of Their Own? Ooh, tough call. There's so many Roberto Alomars in this film because they all played baseball. Um, they they did it in skirts, though, so it makes it a little tougher. Skirts. Um, I would have to say the Roberto Alomar of this film was John Lovitz. Well, that's interesting. Okay, well, why is that? Uh, well, he gets the film going. He uh, gets uh, the players to the tryouts in a very fantastical way, and he hates businessmen, which Roberto Alomar is famous for. Of course. Now, Adam, hmm. whoops do you think was the Roberto Alomar of this film? Well, what was the name of this film? The na name of the film was... Uh, a League of Their Own. Perfect. Yes, it was. Well, thank you so much for asking, Steve. Uh, for me, this is a no-brainer. The Roberto Alomar of A League of Their Own was, of course, Madonna. She was the biggest sexual deviant in the movie and therefore fits the definition perfectly of whomst a Roberto Alomar would be in a film about baseball. And that's the ball game. Hip hip hooray. Salute the troops. What are you doing? Thank you. Yeah, I'm saluting now. I also think it's healthy for women to have sexual thoughts about men. That's true. But, you know, don't sexually harass them. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. I'm going to miss that segment, but I can't wait to get back to Beggar Vance. Yes, even though nobody seems to know who Baker Vance is uh, when I bring it up in uh, my daily conversations and online, uh, I'm still very glad to get back to it and to uh, inform you on who Baker Vance is further. Like, I kind of want to watch it now so that n when we return to Whom's the Beggar ba Vance was, I have a fresh understanding of it. Uh, we'll see. Maybe I'll, I don't know, I don't, you know. It's fun not knowing, but also I'm dying to watch The Legend of Beggar Vance. Robert Redford directed it. There's so It's got so much going for it. It's a great film about the greatest sport in the world, uh, minus baseball. Of course, yeah. Minus baseball and uh, volley women, like, uh, like beach volleyball, women's beach volleyball. and uh, Yeah, women's beach volleyball. Yeah, not men's beach volleyball. Oh, my God, no way. <laughs> Yuck. No, thank you. Like, wear tighter shorts if you want us to watch your sport, men. Yeah, exactly. None of this loose-fitting, baggy nonsense. I want to see the bulge. <laughs> like, I want to see very tight shorts, but maybe, like, a loose bulge so you can see the action. <laughs> Great call. Yeah, that's what we call a full count. Yes, sir. Three balls. Uh, play ball. Uh, <laughs> well, now it's time to get to everyone's <laughs> favorite segment of the week. The Kevin Sorbo Tweet of the Week. Kevin! <laughs> well, what a intro. Thank you for, you know, tuning that up and getting us ready for this segment. Of course. Um, today, whilst we are recording, it is uh, 420. Oh, Happy Stoner Day. Smoke him if you got him, Hitler. <sighs> Hitler? It's his birthday. Oh, it's his birthday. Yeah, he's famous for that. Yeah, but it's probably the thing he's most famous for, is having a birthday on 420. Yeah, he, he talked about it all the time. Anyways, <laughs> uh, 
Kevin Sorbo. It is 10.41 a.m., kind of mid-morning dump. Uh, that's a little weird. Uh, April 18th, uh, 2022. So he's really getting ahead of uh, stoner culture and the holiday that they all celebrate. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the left, colon, weed is legal in 18 states. It's socially acceptable. Therefore, it should be everywhere, period. Uh, space. He uses a little space. Okay, smart. Uh, <laughs> constitutional carry is legal in 25, dot, dot, dot. So essentially what Kevin Sorbo is saying is people with guns should take arms against stokers. Yeah, or if you own a gun, you should definitely be hitting the ganj. Or you should be in one of those 25 states so you can use your gun. That's true. So you can carry a bazooka on your back when you go to 7-Eleven, when you got the munchies. What do you think about constitutional carry? <laughs> wow. Well, first of all, this is not a political podcast. So uh, putting me yeah. on the spot here. I feel, I feel kind of like Dave right now. Uh, I love it. I think that everyone should be able to be armed to the teeth at all times. Uh, we live in modern society, so why not treat it like the Wild West, where anything could pop off at any time, and you know, it like, only takes. I wish I could be a Texan with like a cowboy hat and like a big old revolver on his hip, oh, yeah. walk into Whataburger and get anything I want, and just scream at the person because they put pickles on your burger, and they know that you're serious. Because you're a 400-pound man with a shotgun on your back. So I think that that is your constitutional right, and uh, you're very brave for doing it. And whenever people see people armed to the teeth out in public, the first thought is, what a brave person. Thank you for your service. Thank you for protecting us and keeping this Walmart safe. We appreciate you. I'm allergic to vinegar. I can't have pickles. Get it out of here. <laughs> yeah, get it out of here. So, weed people, you're on notice in those 18 states. Um, good, he got it. The guns are coming for you. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hope. Hopefully. Kevin, happy 420. Yeah, get regular. I want a 12 nooner or yeah. 9 a.m. or not a 1041 a.m. Yuck. Well, Kevin! Always great to hear from you. We love you. I don't mean to harp on his dumps, but if I was taking a dump at 10.41 a.m., I'd shoot myself. <laughs> Who are you, John Lovitz? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I take my dumps and my timing of my dumps very se seriously. As you should. It reflects who you are as a human being. It not only reflects, it genuflex. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Kevin, Science. we're just worried about your bowels. We want we want to make sure, because like you said, it, it it's a one-to-one -one reflection of your health. And so... When you're not regular, it's cons it's cause for concern, uh, as well as if your stool is black or tarry or sticky, all things to look out for. Um, if, you're t if your turds are red, then, you know, maybe try to remember if you ate beets the night before or anything like that. That can sometimes stain them. Or if you drank whatever that beverage was that we created that made your poops red. I don't remember what it was. What was wine. It? wine. Oh, wine. Yeah, that's what it was. Red wine. And remember, it's your constitutional right to take Metamucil, so get on it. George Washington was the most regular guy in the world, and that's why we still remember his name. Wait, why was he the most regular guy in the world? Was he taking Metamucil like yeah. a champ? Yeah. He invented it? Yeah, he didn't have teeth. He had wooden teeth, so he had to drink Metamucil to make sure he got his fiber count. Ah, uh, right, because all that bread back then was chewy, all the wheat... Well, and also, like, you know, fibrous vegetables are real hard to eat for a guy who doesn't have teeth. Yeah, and I don't think he had access to vegetables in Washington. No, in that economy? No way. No way. You got to ship them in. Yeah, from the south. But the south is rising. Who has time for that? Probably a lot of boat traffic. Yeah, up the Mississippi. Yeah, exactly. We're very knowledgeable to, knowledgeable about American history here on the show. You might say that we're scholars of American history in a lot of ways. In Haiti, we got a lot of uh, American history. Uh, it was rife in our textbooks of uh, what happened throughout time. Yeah. And that is definitely uh, traveling 
uh, vegetables up the Mississippi. Most, no, no gambling. No, God, no. Most of our education was about the transport, the packaging and transportation of vegetables in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Mm-hmm. 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 Just before baseball was invented oh, in 1969. Perfect segue into 1994's Disney original. You are pounding that drink. Holy God. That was a pint glass, and I watched you drink all of it in the last two minutes. What was that? Pink lemonade? I was a vitamin drink. Uh, you put an effervescent tab into water, and it gives it a little carbonation. It was, uh, I believe, passion fruit. Where's your coffee today? We're not we're not doing uh, a coffee pour of the week. What is this crab? What are you doing? Uh, nah, I was uh, I was done with coffee for the day. All right, turns out that there was no payoff to the coffee pour of the week segment. <laughs> it turns out this is the payoff, I guess. This is definitely the payoff. You're you're getting paid off right now because uh, I didn't want to have coffee. Oh yeah, I got someone under the table paying me off right now. <laughs> I would like a <laughs> while uh, we're recording. <laughs> yeah, while you were watching the children's movie Angels in the Outfield, you leaned over to your wife and went, wouldn't this movie be better if you were getting topped off? She was like, if I was getting <laughs> topped off? No, probably not. Well, the angels in this movie are famously hot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially the big fat one that looks like Tim Dillon. That one is the hottest one. Yeah, the one that gets maybe the most screen time, except for maybe the uh, female ang- angel that's just rubbing everybody's shoulders, well, the, that's kind of weird. I mean, there's only two angels. Well, three if you count Christopher Lloyd. It's not like there's a, a team yeah. of angels. It's just three of them that are at all interested in baseball. There's also, in the credits, a brother angel that is a black man, and I don't remember that angel What at do you all. mean? Like, his name is Brother Angel? Yeah. Like, in the credits, his name of his character is Brother Angel. <laughs> kind of bad form, Disney. Uh, yeah, really, yeah. Well, 94 was a different time. Uh, well, obviously, this is why this is locked in the Disney vault and not on Disney+. Plus. Not available anywhere for any reason. You can't get it anywhere. It's, like, an impossible movie to find. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, you can guess how we got it. Uh, but, uh, oh, God. Oh, we're going to get... <laughs> there's a knock at my door. We're going to get our door kicked in. We have legally owned VHSs and VHS players. Obviously. Obviously. No, well, the VHSs are legally owned. I stole my VHS player, but that's fine. That was in 1996, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, Disney doesn't give a crap about stealing VHS players. They don't have their wick in that business. No, a Panasonic? Who cares? Get it out of here. Did you have this uh, movie on VHS or DVD or in your life? I didn't, but my neighbor growing up had it, and that's the first time I saw this movie, and we loved this movie as kids growing up. And then there was like a large gap when I didn't watch it until you re-entered my life, and then I watched it again. But uh, yeah, this was like, I, I like... I'd forgotten a lot about it, and then watching it, a lot of childhood memories were flooding back to me. So it was a nice trip down memory lane. Taylor, wherever you are, uh, I hope you're still alive. Taylor Taylor. Well, I certainly can't tell you his last name. That would be doxing. Yeah, that would be the ish God. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, Danny Glover? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I invoked my inner Danny Glover for that one. Uh, I apologize, but he came through me. Of course he did. Yeah, he he infested you, much like he did the fat, hairy guy who gets his friggin' teeth knocked out in this movie. Yeah, well, everybody wants to get chopped off, right? True enough. It's hard to eat a ballpark hot dog without any fucking teeth. <laughs> I definitely had the uh, VHS for this movie. And I had like maybe four or five VHSs I would watch regularly. Of this and movie, this was definitely one of them. You had four copies of Angels in the Outfield. <laughs> yeah, four <laughs> or five. Wow, <laughs> you couldn't remember so many. Yeah, well, the tape gets worn out. It was yeah. physical film back in the day, and you were constantly playing rewind, play rewind, play rewind. I want to see, I want to see Matthew McConaughey get lifted into the air by angels over and over and over again. I want to listen to Hippie Hippie Shake, or at least the middle part of Hippie Hippie Shake, <laughs> like 50 times in a day. A heavily edited Hippie Hippie Shake. <laughs> well, it's too horny. Hippie Hippie Shake is a famously horny song. Of course. The kids are going to know that it's horny, and you got to get it out of there. The kids are going to nut. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that Hippie Hippie Shake. These kids are going to nut. 
It's me, Bob Iger. And it out that hippie hippie shake. I don't want these kids to nut when they're seeing angels in the outfield. Famous, uh, you know, <coughs> editor and uh, <laughs> film sophisticate. Yes. Famously concerned about children's nut, Bob Iger. Yeah, he would go into the editing rooms at Disney and sit there with Walt Disney and yell at him. Of course. Drinking heavily. Hounding him about all the horniness in those movies. Cigars coming out of the wazoo, oh. liquor on tap. <laughs> I got to say, that's one of the things I absolutely loved about this movie is how many people are smoking darts the entire film. They're just <laughs> people just ripping darts in front of kids and just smoking everywhere. Like this is a Disney movie. <laughs> this, like that's probably why it's not on Disney Plus is because of all the cigarette smoke in it. Well, and then they get away with it, I guess, at the end by saying you will die young if you smoke. I mean, no. But there's still so much smoking and it looks so cool. Oh, yeah. When Dermot Mulroney puts a cigarette out on his leg. Oh, my God. He's so cool. <laughs> they should add JP have a smoke, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Danny Glover should have, like, blown smoke in his face and you should have gone, oh, that smells good. And then the next shot, he's got a dart between each of the gaps in his teeth. Spoiler alert, but Danny Glover adopts these kids at the end of <laughs> wow, the movie. Wow, that is a spoiler alert. Oh, my God. That's literally the last scene of the movie. That's like the whole movie about fatherhood and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but uh, the reason why he adopts them is because he's going to teach them how to smoke and have funny online videos and break it in. Oh, yeah. He was, he was like, he was way ahead of the curve on that one. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. It's I'm, cool to look at children smoking. I mean, unlike Justin Timber, like, he wasn't having trouble with the curve. He was way ahead of the curve. <laughs> Man, how could you even mention that movie? People are going to be so upset that we didn't cover Trouble with the Curve. I'm so sorry, everyone. Maybe next uh, spring training. Maybe we'll yeah. do it again. I don't know. I, who knows what's going to happen? You know, we just, it's our show. We do what we want. We don't answer to anyone. Except David The Aaron most White. erotic baseball film since Bull Durham. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I can't believe we didn't do Bull Durham. Yeah, well, it's in the dirt now. Maybe next year, That's kids. That's true. It's it's in the Criterion collection. Is it really? Yeah, I have the Criterion channel, and it's on there. I'm like, Bull Durham. All right, cool. Like Susan Sarandon's hot as frick. Fine, I get it. That's fine. Humble brag, too, that you have uh, the Criterion collection. Well, it's the only streaming service I subscribe to, so... <laughs> <laughs> and do I watch it? Not really, because I'm hardly ever in the mood for the highbrow entertainment they have on there. I like things like 1994's Angels in the Outfield. Yeah, give us the good stuff. Mm -hmm. Shove it down our throats, Angels in the Outfield. What a friggin' cast in this movie. We've already yep. mentioned Joseph Gordon-Levitt. We've already mentioned Danny Glover. We've already mentioned Matthew McConaughey. But we haven't mentioned... Tony Danza and Neil McDonough and Christopher Lloyd. Maybe we have mentioned him, actually. And Academy Award winner Adrian Brody and some woman named Brenda Fricker. I don't know who that is, but that's a great name. I had to write it down. She's Fricker, Fricker, Brenda Fricker. <laughs> She's the... Uh... She's the bird lady from Home Alone 2. Oh, I thought I recognized her. That's old Fricker, huh? Yeah, that's the Fricker that got her there. Well, you uh, know, <laughs> no, that was Fricker. Fricker probably did uh, Bird Lady after this, right? Uh, probably same time. I, I'm pretty sure Home Alone 2 is like 93, so maybe even before. Oh, maybe. You know, it was the summer of Fricker, as they said. You couldn't go to the, th the theater and not see a Fricker up on the screen. She does have that warming old lady quality to her that you just can't get past. She's great with kids. And she's great with pigeons. Yeah, well, not in this movie that you see. Uh, maybe she's out back, you know, feathering pigeons. Maybe, maybe, maybe you she taught Mike Tyson how to race them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did he do that, race uh, pigeons, yeah. or is that just because he, like, raced a bunch of animals? No, I think he, like, raced pigeons at one time. Like, he would run, and the pigeons would fly, and he would race them and <laughs> see who wins. Yeah, you got to get angry when you're training. You got to get angry at something, well, and sure. his trainers obviously pick pigeons. Well, and, like, the best way to train as a boxer is to release a bunch of pigeons, like, in the room and have you try to box them out of the air. And if you can punch yeah. a pigeon out of the air mid-flight, you're a damn good boxer. 
They used to have to chase chickens, but now you want to punch pigeons. Of course, yeah. Oh, beautifully put. Yeah, the old Dave special chasing chickens. <laughs> Whoa, now. <laughs> hey, you put him on blast. I didn't put him on blast. I, I didn't put him on blast, but uh, I feel like he's had enough. <laughs> Yeah. All right, okay. He's much like uh, a, a pigeon in a gym with Mike Tyson. He's had enough. <laughs> Can you believe Adrian Brody is in this film for like two minutes? <laughs> Man, uh, I was like blown away by the team that they had, that they had assembled. This all-star lineup. I didn't know that Neil McDonough and Matthew McConaughey and Adrian Brody all starred in a movie together. Well, starred is maybe too strong of a word. We're in a movie together. It's beautiful. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. The paychecks must have been flowing for this film. Obviously, a lot of uh, production. The cinematography is absolutely delightful, starting with that first credit scene with the clouds and the angels. It's it's a beautiful film. Oh, yeah. Adrian Brody, most famous for sexually assaulting Halle Berry at the Oscars, a moment that everybody loves. Did he do that? <clears throat> yeah. I don't remember that uh, award ceremony. Yeah, he ran up on stage and grabbed her and kissed her right in front of her husband and children. Oh, was it tongue, though? Oh, yeah. And he had his hand up her oh, dress. Well, that's naughty. But that's everyone, not cool. Hey, we got a standing ovation. Everyone loved it. Well, <laughs> the Academy is famously naughty. Well, that's true. I mean, just look at Roberto, B Roberto Benini or whatever his name is. Yeah, <laughs> first, the first line in this movie is, do you believe in heaven? Beautiful. Set the tone right away. And, and do you believe in heaven? Oh, of course. I've been there. I know what it's all about. Streets are paved in gold. There's pubes everywhere. I, I have to assume that JP does not actually believe in heaven, but he's just there for JGL's comfort. Yeah, he's too young to really understand, like... I mean, he's too young, and we find out that he lived in a car. So, yeah. how would he ever go to church? He's a pretty dumb kid. He he doesn't really know anything yet. Uh, he's just trying to make his way uh, in the world. And he's a he's a garbage kid. People... <laughs> People have been tossing him around his whole life. Yeah, it's uh, it's a very tragic story. Your video is frozen, and I'm worried we're going to lose you at any second here, pal. You're, no. you're, it's such a, <laughs> oh my lord, you're, it's a, such an un, uh, unflattering <laughs> freeze frame of you. <laughs> you look like you've my been, end's doing great. You look like you've been hitting 420 very early in this freeze frame. <laughs> Very early. <laughs> uh, my computer's doing great today. I think it's going to shine through, um, I, but it, it, it could crash at any moment. Hey, as JP would say, it could happen. It could happen. It could happen. That was one of the things I remember Taylor quoting all the time when we were kids, and he hated yeah. it. He hated that line. He was like, he would mercilessly mock JP about that line. That's that's cool though. Like when you're a kid and like mocking. Uh, Another a young kid? one, a little Nina, yeah. saying it could happen. Oh, but. yeah. What a loser. Yeah. <laughs> Although, <laughs> JP does have maybe the best joke in this movie. When him and JGL get home from their bike ride, and uh, Fricker says, Hey, do you boys, you're supposed to be home by five. And she holds out her watch to JGL, and he goes, Oh, and then she holds it out to JP, and he goes, I can't tell time. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's pretty funny. It's <laughs> a pretty good joke. But then she says it's it is almost five or close enough. So what the heck is she harping on? <laughs> yeah. One of the or something else I noticed about that. Oh, you're back, thank God. Something else I noticed about that scene where they're like riding their bikes through the neighborhood. Did you see that car just like booting it around the corner, <laughs> like just driving like fifty miles an hour in a residential neighborhood, just whipping around the corner and taking off? I did not see that. Maybe they were like filming a different movie. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah, maybe there was like I Terminator. Don't know. Sure, the Italian job. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was probably the Italian job. <laughs> it's crazy to me that Disney had such a hard on for like California sports teams. We got the Mighty Ducks. We got Angels in the Outfield. Why didn't they make a movie about the Oakland Raiders? Like a nice, warming kids Disney movie about the uh, naughtiest team in the league. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How about the black hole? A kid who gets sucked into the black hole at a, at the, at a Raiders game. <laughs> yeah, that sounds cool. That's heartwarming. That's for the kids. Yeah, he comes out wearing 
you know, horny helmet and just black all over his face, just screaming mad. Ah, oh, beautiful. <laughs> horny helmet in what way? Uh, it's got horns on it. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. I, I was thinking of something else that no, like no, no. made you horny no. or like made other people horny. It's a Disney movie. They don't want kids to nut. It's just a helmet with horns. I don't know. The this movie says something different. Well, that's certainly true. And that what it says is Dermot Mulroney is cool as frick. He is a <laughs> dart smoking deadbeat dad who smokes in Fricker's house and abandons his son at every possible opportunity. Yeah, we get to see the deadbeat dad real early. They lay the uh, plot out very quickly. He'll he'll basically be a dad when the angels win the pennant, and they're in last place, so he's never going to be a father to this kid. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's the main thing I remember from the movie. When are we going to be a family again? When the angels win the pennant? Oh, I guess never. Oh, well, thanks, Dad. <laughs> You're a piece of shit. Thanks for that. Traded in the truck for a hog. Which Smart, is though. cool. It's better for traveling, he says. But it, he's there in like a couple of weeks when they have to do the court case, so I don't know where he freaking traveled to. Yeah, he just says, I have to go up north. And at first I yeah. went, oh, you're going to jail. And then, oh, no, I guess you're not because <laughs> you're here in court just in a jean jacket ripping darts. Like, I don't know. What, what, what were you doing up north? Are you a drug... Are you a drug dealer? What's your deal, Mulrooney? He might be a drug dealer. Like, his uh, wife slash girlfriend, side piece, uh, died, yeah. uh, JGL's mother, mm -hmm. so maybe she OD'd. Maybe. That's a very, yeah, that's interesting. Maybe it'll be explored in Sons of Thunder Season 2. <laughs> I hope they talk about angels in the outfield. Really, like, <laughs> wrap up the storyline in uh, Sons of Thunder Resurrections or whatever. Redemption, called. please. <laughs> they should have gone with Resurrection. Absolutely, they should have, yeah. Uh, so the Angels are playing a game. Uh, they're playing a series against the Toronto Blue Jays, and I was thrilled to see that because this movie is in 1994, and wouldn't you know it, Roberto Alomar was on the team at that time. He, of course, is not in this movie because I don't think any actual baseball players are in this movie. But logically, he was playing for the Blue Jays at that time. So very exciting to imagine him out there on second base, hitting dingers, being the MVP of the league. Just a beautiful man who will never do anything wrong yeah, at that at, point. At, at that, that point, time, yeah. they definitely thought that they were hot off of uh, two World Series wins back to back so they're like the biggest team in baseball during this time uh so it makes sense why they would have them in this movie i was doing some research on old roberto because just out of curiosity and like i didn't yeah. realize that like he won the world series for them like he was the one yeah. who got the scoring run in 92 that's crazy i didn't know that that's so wild yeah, it was a big deal, Holyfield. He uh, he won them the World Series. He was a he was a god amongst men, which is why he thought he could be a bad person and get away. From in 2014, it. yeah. I mean, he yeah, also but he, you know well he the also World Series lasts. Well, of course, yeah. A win's a win, and no one can take that away from you. Just like no one can take away when you spit in an umpire's face, Roberto Alomar, in 1996. Ooh, did he have HIV? That'd be <laughs> the umpire. I don't know. <laughs> No, the spitter has to have HIV. <laughs> oh, it's a hate crime. I see what you're saying. <laughs> Maybe that's why he spit in the umpire's face. The umpire was like, hey, Roberto, just a heads up. I just tested positive for HIV. And he was like, get out of here. I'm really glad we delved into that. We really needed to uh, talk about that spit in the face. Yeah, well, it's one of the most important aspects of Roberto Alomar's career. Well, uh, speaking of pieces of crap when uh, it comes to baseball, sure. we're introduced uh, pretty soon to Mr. George Knox, the angry man of baseball, the manager of the Angels. A.K.A. Danny Glover. Danny Glover was cool back then. Danny Glover's the and man. He's the man. He's awesome. He's always angry. It, every Danny Glover role... I expect that character to die of a heart attack once the movie ends. That's pretty much how it goes. He does look like he just lumbers around and is like any moment away from death. Did you find out how old he was during the filming of this? Nope. Did you? Yeah, me either. Well, then no. No, I, had, I, I couldn't look it up. I did look up how old Tony Danzi was, and he was like 43. Well, that's prime age for a pitcher. 
Yeah, prime age for a pitcher. Apparently, Danny Glover's only like five years older than uh, Tony Danzer. Oh, I thought you were going to say the Joseph Gordon-Levitt. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a time shift. It was a rough five years for him. Like, really rough. The worst five years oh, anyone yeah. has ever lived. I I think that Danny Glover's like really good with these kids. He, uh, he has to play the part of this uh, curmudgeon that warms up over time mm. and adopts these kids. And he does a very good job at it. It's it is so ballsy of this movie to be like, and then Danny Glover adopted these kids. When it's like, <laughs> he loves these kids because they helped him win a pennant. And yeah, they're nice, and he's nice. But like, next year is a brand new season, and if the team's doing crappy again, how is that relationship going to work out between all of them? Like, they're back on the street. These kids are young. Danny Glover is old already at this point. I just, uh, I don't think it was a wise decision for them to go, yeah, give him to the baseball player. Who cares? Well, these are garbage kids, so you can That's just true. drop them on Fricker's door whenever you want. <laughs> whenever you start losing, it, it's it's easier. The amount of times those kids have heard back to Fricker in their life is just, like, uncountable. <laughs> yeah, they get to live in this huge mansion that Danny Glover has, beautiful, like, maids and food and oh, vacations yeah. Oh, yeah. but then once you start losing it's back to frick of course and your good luck charm is run dry and you don't need these kids anymore yeah. the angels are never coming back like they were only there for one season they're not coming back next year run super dry oh yeah <laughs> i do love that danny glover like is introduced like yelling at his like pitcher and then they get into a fight and then it becomes like a bench clearing brawl but only the Angels. Like, they just run out there and are fighting each other, and the Jays run out, and their coach goes, whoa, 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 that's not our fight. And they're like, oh, yeah, right. We don't have to fight these guys. They're fighting <laughs> each other. That's great. Great joke. Uh, usually when you uh, clear the benches, you fight each other, but this this team is so filled with strife and anxiety. <sighs> they're the bottom of the league, uh, so they're just fighting themselves. It was it was a fun joke. It, yeah, it was a, it's fun. It's fun for them. Um fun. The next thing that really like brought me back to my childhood was after the game when they lose and there's that one player like rapping in the like yeah. locker room that we used to rap that all the time. That was like yeah. definitely a thing that was repeated constantly. They're like, "We can't win. That would be a that sin." That would be a sin. <laughs> yeah, co constantly. <laughs> like that would be a sin. That line I I repeated that all the time when I was a kid and probably in my stoner 20s as well. <laughs> it's so hip. It's so hip. It's very cool. That's why they got the Latino guy to do it. Latinx, sorry. <laughs> yeah, they uh, stuffed a couple of Latinx uh, characters in this movie because the Latinx community was coming up in baseball. Oh, of course. Yeah, you got your Jose Canseco's. You've got your Roberto Alomar's. You've got all the finest Puerto Rican players, <laughs> Dominican, <laughs> all the best South American players you can ask for. That was very well said. Very elegant. Thank the you. Puerto Ricans are going to love you. it. They're going to glom onto this show immediately. <laughs> we want to appeal to our Latinx community. Yes, more Latinx community because we all know Jesus was Latin. Of course he was. He was Latin and X, yeah. He was non-binary. Everybody knows that about Jesus. Yeah, when he was on the cross and just before he died, uh, he, he talked about sinning and all that, yeah, of but course, yeah. he also said, I'm Latin X. <laughs> he also said, here are my pronouns. They, them, <laughs> and then he died. They, them, Latin X. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Did you see the Safeway sign at the ballpark? More like Safe My Way. <laughs> that might, might be my favorite joke of all time. Uh, I did see the Safeway uh, sign. Growing up in the remote uh, areas of Haiti, going to Safeway every day, you think Safeway is your thing. But more like Safe My Way for everyone. Oh, everyone's a Safe My Way, of course. Yeah. Even in California, there's Safeways everywhere. And they sponsor baseball teams somehow. Inexplicably. It's crazy. It's crazy. I can't believe it. I really love it. <laughs> Here's a line I remember from the trailers. There's a thing called talent. They don't have it. And they don't. I guess. Well, they do. It's just latent. I guess it's just like hidden in them. Well, not so much hidden as in, like, 
supernatural powers uh, <laughs> do dumb stuff to make them win. That's outrageous. Once the Angels show up, this movie gets outrageous. The fact that they don't just cancel the season is ridiculous to me at that point. <laughs> Yeah, there would have to be some kind of weird virus or, like, mm -hmm. some crazy thing happening. You would shut down the whole country <laughs> if you saw a man lifted and leaping for, like, 20 feet to catch a ball. If you saw a ball slow down and practically stop in front of Adrian Brody and then bounce all over the field in crazy patterns, you would go... They're cheating. They're, there's cheating going on here right now. We need to shut down the league and investigate this. There's no way they would be allowed. And then they go on to win the friggin' pennant. They were like, okay, we can't just make the Angels, uh, like, make miraculous catches. We can't just make them give go home runs. So they slow down a ball for Adrian Brody <laughs> and then make it bounce everywhere and put on hippie hippie shakes. As right. a kid... I love that scene. As an adult, that's not real life. Well, <laughs> you're right. That isn't real life. <laughs> also, Christopher Lloyd like moves the the like the foul ball pole at one point. He like bends mm -hmm. it so that the ball goes foul when it's clearly a fair ball. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> no, no ump would go. Well, the the pole moved, so I guess it can't. There's nothing in the rule book that says the pole can't move. I'm I'm sure that was in the trailer too. Probably like four or five times. He opened with it for sure, mm -hmm. and then like in the montage of the commercial, you show it, mm -hmm. and then definitely at the end. Oh yeah, it's called talent. They don't have it. Fair ball. <laughs> we can't win. That would be a sin. See, it's just that's just how a trailer is made. You take all the best parts. Hey, welcome to this week's trailer breakdown, where we tell you how a trailer is made. Which also is, like, the complete middle of this movie is just a bunch of, like, angels doing s stuff. Yeah, god magic leading to baseball shenanigans. Well, it, it all starts with JGL praying to the stars after Miguel is obviously a terrible person to him. Yeah, and, he's got a No Fear t-shirt. Uh, do you do you pray to God at night? Every night. Every night I go, God, if there is a God, if you're a man or a woman, and then loudly in my head I hear, a man, and I go, oh, right, of course. Sorry, sorry, God, you're a man. The, my apologies. The P. Exactly, yeah. That's where we get it from. I can't believe they use the line, God, if there is a God. Like, what kind of church community would allow that? Yeah. Of course there's a God. You're praying. Clearly there is a God if you're praying, stupid kid. Good prayer. Sure. You want a family and for the angels to win the pennant. No problem. Let me just make it happen. I'm a, I'm a genie. So from all the media that we've consumed from the Christian community, ah. I have learned that if somebody were to start their prayer with God, if there is a god, he would probably give them cancer or like burn their life down, right? I mean, I can think of one ball player who probably started uh, his prayers like that, and then he got cancer. Well, yeah, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. But then, like, God's like, yeah, go help him out. Does he? Like, I don't know. It's so weird. It's just like, ain't like Christopher Lloyd shows up to talk to Joseph Gordon Levitt at the next ball game, and he's just like, Hey, I'm an angel. No one else can see me. Don't even worry about it. You're just going to look insane to everyone all around you because you're just staring at nothing while I talk to you for, while I monologue to you. Yeah, help this kid, uh, you know, contain his insanity. You're just making him look like a crazy person. And he doesn't even try to make it incognito. He's coming out, out of his pop. Yeah. He's... <laughs> doing just like crazy things it's wild that like nobody can see him but he can like interact with things like he steals a guy's hat at one point he he's holding popcorn and then he disappears and the popcorn falls down like people would have seen that so people were just looking at a floating bag of popcorn and a floating hat i feel hat? like they're trying to construct this alternate universe wow. where crazy stuff happens all the time and that's why they're able to accept the ball slowing down, the right. people floating, the, the pee. foul line move. Of course, yeah, because people are, I don't know, Bill Clinton was president, anything could happen. Yeah, uh, She-Hulk was president, probably. Hey, certainly, uh, the first lady. I don't know what that means. I don't know, I don't know. So, <laughs> Matthew McConaughey <laughs> makes a miraculous catch. Matthew McConaughey is wasted in this movie, and I don't mean hammered, but he is just like... He is not used to his full potential in this movie. No. He probably got paid like a hundred grand for like 
a week's worth of work or something. He's like a background person and then like pops in once in a while. He got paid 15 grand to be in this movie, I would wager. 100 grand, that's a lot of money. You got Danny Glover on the cast. You got Chubby Cheek Joseph Gordon Levitt before Third Rock from the Sun. That kid's pulling in lots of money. Well, this was 94, so 100 grand would have been like crazy money, but yeah. he was in a couple of things before this, right? Well, probably, yeah. It it's wild to me though that like so just to jump back to the opening credits for a second, the first name that shows up is Danny Glover, and then it says Angels in the Outfield, and I was like, is he the only one who's getting credited in this movie? That's crazy. <laughs> but he's he's above yeah. the fold, I guess, thanks to the Lethal Weapon franchise, I would imagine. Well, you got to put somebody above the title and uh that really sells the movie yeah. in the 90s. Oh, okay. People don't go to movies for fun or for popcorn. They go for the stars. Yeah, they go to see Danny Glover, the hottest actor of 1994, Daniel Glover. Uh, and Frickers above JGL. A lot yep. of people are above JGL in the uh, credits. And he's the one pulling all the weight. Yeah, he's he... got to do school on top of this. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's not fair. That's uh, He can't win. That would be a sin. Well, he can't, yeah. Yeah. Damn it. Uh, he got there right before me. <laughs> I was champing at the bridge. So Matthew McConaughey gets carried by angels, makes a miraculous catch. The bat catcher hits a ball so hard that his bat explodes. Like, explodes. Yeah. And then we get the best line in the movie when Joseph Gordon-Levitt goes, there are angels in the outfield. And we say, yeah! <laughs> he said it! Thank you! And angels in the infield. Who cares? <laughs> He says the titular line, and then he, like, mumbles that they're in the infield as well, just to cover your bases. Of course, yeah. Uh, did you know that they made two sequels to this movie? I didn't know that. I, I knew that there was one. There's a football one, right? No, there's Angels in the Infield, which is, like, the sequel yeah. to this movie. But then there's also Angels on the Racetrack, which is, like, <laughs> about Christopher Lloyd helping, like, race car drivers or something like that. Out of the game. Yeah, for, whoa, and he into crashed the wall. Into, yeah, he crashed into the wall. Whoa. <laughs> My favorite line of this movie is not a line at all. Oh, it's great. when uh, a man gets hit in the balls yeah. with a ball during the hippie hippie shake scene. Yeah, of course, yeah. and that's you got to have a crotch shot. Of course, that's that's child. It's a children's comedy 101. Yeah, and I I laugh every time. So maybe I'm still a child. Hey, maybe you are. Happy 420. I love that uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt is like talking to Christopher Lloyd about the angel stuff and he's like, hey, don't tell anyone about the angels. I mean, your friend JP knows and Danny Glover knows and that's that's enough. Don't tell anybody else. And then as soon as he leaves, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's like, there's angels. Hey, <laughs> like, yeah, there's angels here. Like He's just like screaming about it to Danny Glover. So like the people behind you know, the like media guy know, everybody knows at that point. You just keep it to yourself, kid. Yeah, it's like that loud, drunk person at a bar that doesn't realize that people are right beside him and can hear everything he says. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, it works. I mean, he, there's no punishment for that, so that's good. No, there's definitely no punishment. The angels don't take JGL out and, like, punish him Kill for him? his rude behavior. No, <laughs> they don't take him out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, I love that JP is like, I, I can't get in your car, Danny Glover. I used to sleep in a car, and I get all freaked out by them. Can you drive me in the Angels team bus? And he's like, all right, yeah. Me, the manager, drive the team bus? Sure, I'll drive it into this residential neighborhood and hope I don't run anything over with it. Do you think that was, like, a great day on set uh -huh. or, like, the worst day on set for no. Danny Glover? Like, driving a bus like that must have been fun, right? Well, he didn't drive it. There's no way he was driving that bus. They they show him in the driver's seat once the bus is fully stopped and the door is open and it's not moving anymore. And I do believe he was sitting in the driver's seat at that point. But I don't think he drove that bus. I think you need a special They license. show him pulling up, and it, it looks like he's in there, or somebody who looks exactly like him. I mean, it's Disney, so this, they're yeah. sticking to detail. It could have been anyone, well, but... Steve's over here acting like all Danny Glovers look the same. <laughs> no. no! Oh, it's definitely Danny Glover driving that bus. <laughs> sure it is. It looks sure. like Danny Glover. Yeah. And if I was a Danny Glover in 1994, I'd be demanding I drive that bus. You'd probably think it was Brother Angel. Am I making that up? What, Brother Angel? I don't know. I didn't yeah. watch the credits. I didn't stick around for him. 
Because I knew there, I knew there cool. wasn't going to be a post credit scene or anything. There wasn't going to be a, a a tease for the new Doctor Strange or anything in there. I don't care. That's a great thing about like older movies is that you don't have to sit around for the stupid credits and watch yeah. some crappy scene that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, you can just shut it off whenever you want. <laughs> yeah, it tells you to shut it off, and then you can shut it off. <laughs> So Tony Danza's in this movie, and he's a, 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 a pitcher coming to the end of his career. He's, uh, you know, he's, he looks like he's got a bit of a shoulder injury that he's been rehabbing, and he used to play for Danny Glover in Cincinnati, and they have some bad blood, but JGL sees an angel rubbing his shoulders, and he goes, you got to put him in, Danny Glover, you gotta, he's got an angel. So it forces the two men to make up, and... Tony Danza goes on to pitch a perfect game. Beautiful. He, uh, it was weird that Knox slash, uh, you know, Danny Glover, yeah, uh, tries to get as much detail about the massage out of JGL. <laughs> like he really wants like a lot of details, right. and it's kind of creepy. What's he working? Are they working on his delts? What are they working on? His pecs? Yeah. Is he got lotion? Do angels have lotion? What kind of goo are they using? Where's their? Do they have like a you know like a certificate of uh, professionalism or anything like that? Are they a registered <laughs> massage therapist? We can't have just like a body worker on the team. We need to have a registered massage therapist, kid. Yeah, is that angel a body worker? <laughs> I mean, he's working that body if you know what I mean. Which is what JGL says. Of course. And then of course he puts him in. Of course, because he's working that body. Working that body. It's. Amazing though that that no hitter he throws is just uh, unbelievable. I guess I don't well, know. Well, especially since he hasn't like he's on the injured list, so he hasn't been like uh, pitching for a very long time, <laughs> and then he just gets taken off and put right in, and all of his warm up pitches look like utter crap. Very hittable utter crap. Oh yeah, it's much like uh, the guy from pitching no uh, pitching love no what was it. <laughs> Romance in the outfield, Romance double the play. Outfield. Yep, much double like that. Play. As if that guy, I mean, what happened was Tony Danza just like visualized throwing a no-hitter and then he went out and threw a perfect no-hitter. Perfect no-hitter. What I, I glommed on to in the past couple of minutes is that you not remembering helped me remember what it was. Oh, that's the beautiful. fact that you were struggling, you know, brought me up. Yeah, well, I'm hey, happy to help. That's what I'm here for. I, Thank you for being the wind between my wings. I lift you up so you can stand on mountains. Yeah, and catch that foul ball. Yeah, damn right. You gotta. <laughs> when the Angels push Matthew McConaughey into the outfield <laughs> wall and his hand goes through the wall, the wooden that wall. would hurt like a son of a gun. <laughs> it would be a career-ending injury. It like, would have yeah. shattered his hand and elbow and forearm. Because he, they, like, like, they push him. He's already running full tilt, and they go, like, here's an extra 30 kilometers an hour for you. And just yeah. smashes through. And then, like, that was smashes through and slams into the wall. Sorry, I keep cutting you, but just, it's such a crazy scene. No, I, I'm as hopped up as you are, because, like, that would just destroy every bone in your hand. <laughs> yeah. And the amount of surgery and oh. rehab would take years and years. Compound it's beautiful. Oh, compound fractures from the tip of your fingers to, the, like, your shoulder, to your acromion process. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> but he just pulls out his uh, glove and he caught the ball. And, you know, maybe that's, like, the real uh, miracle of this movie is that he didn't break his hand. I think so, yeah. that Nobody talks about it, but that is the miracle, is that he, he didn't break his hand. Also, at one point, they, like... The, the bat catcher is, like, running from second to third, and he takes, like, three steps from second base, and an angel just pushes him, and he slides the entire length of, the like, the baseline between two and three. <laughs> Someone's going to notice that. Like, that's that's yeah. hard to miss. And he, he just turns over, and his fans are, like, uh, you know, rapping on their chest, uh, just like he does. But I... If that happened to me, I'd just be screaming for, like, maybe <laughs> hours because that can't happen. I think about that all the time in movies. Like, whenever something happens in a movie, like, okay, just as, a, as an example, let's say in, like, a vampire movie or something like that, right, where they discover that, the like, vampires exist, that would shatter your reality. 
You would not recover from You'd be like, wait a minute, what do you mean? Like, it would be a mind-altering thing that would happen, and you, it would be so hard to bounce back from that. To get shoved by an angel and slide 40 feet into the... That would shatter your reality. You'd go, how did that happen? What's what's going on? And then it would shatter all reality, and it would shatter realities for everybody on Earth, for all mankind. Yeah, it would be definitive proof that God exists. Like this movie is definitive proof in this universe that God exists, and, <laughs> and that's wild to me. That's that's yeah. the thing they don't talk about in these movies is just how it would change everything if that happened. Out of all the miracles that the angels provide in this movie, which one do you think stands the most to, like, break reality and uh, prove that God exists? Oh, like, probably Matthew McConaughey getting carried by angels an extra 20 feet to catch a ball. The fact that he jumps and then just flies. Like, he just flies along and catches a ball. People would go, what is happening? And that's, like, the first miracle. That's the first one. And it would shatter the world into a million pieces. Oh, I just, I can't even wrap my head around. I hope it never happens. As McConaughey says, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. And it was God intervention, of course. <clears throat> it was two angels. He was like, it felt like someone carrying me under my arms. Because yeah, it was, man. Angels exist. God <laughs> exists. Stop sinning, everyone. That means hell exists. <laughs> The consequences of this are unbelievable. Check your pits, dog, because you just got carried. <laughs> he just, like, rolls up his sleeve, and he has just deep finger-shaped <laughs> bruises in his arms. Yeah. It's like, what happened to me? 666 six, six in the middle of the palm. <laughs> of course, he's got the mark of the beast at that point. He, he's, he's chosen by Satan himself. Yeah. These are angels of the devil. Absolutely, yeah. Why... I, uh, if we ever make a movie for Pure Flix, it should be like that kind of thing where it starts off as like a lighthearted kids movie about angels in the outfield or something like that. And then that revelation just utterly destroys society in some way. Like yeah. just uh, uh, changes everything. Oh, they never explore it. Not in a good enough way for me. No, uh, there's never a character like, but what? What are you talking about? Yeah. There's angels in the outfield? Tell well, me more. Especially because JP just reveals to, like, a reporter that, yeah, there's angels that are helping the team. And then they publish it uh. in the newspaper. And nobody goes, look, on its own, that would be crazy. But take this with everything else that's going on with the team, and I think we can say that angels exist here. I think we can prove that with this. Uh, JP, going to the press, like... If you teach this kid anything, don't talk to the press. Right? Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth when the <laughs> press come over. They're vultures. They're leeches. The It's all fake news, and everybody hates the press. And that's, like, the low point of this movie. The one, the part at the end where they have to build back up after is him telling the press that these angels exist. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and also Joseph Gordon-Levitt misses one game and then they lose and Danny Glover's just like, well, I guess it's over for us. The Angels don't have what it takes, I guess. It's like, but he also, Joseph Gordon-Levitt told you that like the Angels aren't always helping you guys. Like the team is good. Yeah. They're, they're good enough on their own. And he's just like, nah, got to throw in the towel. That's it for us. You just got to believe. Not only is there not like a real down moment other than the orphans and their parents sucking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the there's no real bad guy. The bad guy of this movie is the announcer for the Angels. Yeah. And he's just a crappy person. Yeah, he's just got a real chip on his shoulder for Danny Glover. I guess they used to... Well, we don't know why he hates Danny Glover. We know why Danny Glover hates him, because when they played ball against each other, he slid into home plate and kicked Danny Glover in the knee with his cleats and wrecked his knee and ruined his baseball career. But we don't, I don't know why he did it to him. He just, I get, well, he's probably racist. He probably just hates Danny Glover. That's probably all it is. He's probably super racist. That's what I got out of the film. Mm -hmm. He d he definitely doesn't have any, like, backstory or reasoning for being this piece of crap person other than he loves money. Oh, my God. It would have made me so happy if at the end of this movie he was like, well, I guess a comment of mine went out over the air earlier, and I, I am <laughs> deeply ashamed of it. I like to think of myself as a man of faith, and uh, oh, it's a it's a pop fly by Neil McDonough that's going to be a home run. 
and that's going to be the Angels winning the pennant, and then <laughs> the movie ends. And then I'm fired for some reason. <laughs> like He does get fired, so he gets his comeuppance, and the bad guy loses. But, he, like, why does he get fired? And also, like he says, he's like, we have a contract. You can't just fire me. I haven't done anything wrong. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm ah, down. You on, pay him out. I'm down on the team, but that's not against the law. <laughs> like, it's, it's not a fireable thing to be critical of the team that's literally cheating and using angels to win. <laughs> this guy's the <laughs> hero of the movie, as far as I'm concerned. I've totally done a 180 on him. Yeah, they are essentially cheating. It it yeah. does kind of suck the fun out of this movie that the last game doesn't have any hijinks or fun or angels. But it doesn't need them because the real angels were the friends we made along the way. <laughs> Very true, but I, I want more hippie hippie shakes. I, <laughs> you and me both. You know what my favorite part about the last game is? Mm. When Christopher Lloyd comes, shows up, and he's like, hey, uh, JGL, I'm here. And he's like, oh, are the angels going to show up? And he goes, oh, no, no, no. I'm just here to check on Tony Danza. He's going to die of lung cancer in six months. All right, see you later, kid. <laughs> just like, bye-bye. <laughs> Flies away. Yeah, you're right. Them replacing the hijinks of the angels with uh, <laughs> them telling a little kid that a man is about to die in six months is better. Like, it's worth it and more entertaining. He's cursed Joseph Gordon-Levitt with knowledge. He has cursed that kid because now he knows Tony Dance is going to die. <laughs> And he can't do it. Yeah. He's just to go. Well, I, I mean, if I even if I tell him he's going to die in six months, so it doesn't. I guess I just have to live with this until he dies, and then I can get on with my life. Oh, Danny Glover, you're my new dad. I love you. I've totally forgotten about Tony Danza dying of cancer horribly. How much weight do you have to put on this eight year old child? Like, why tell him that he's about to die? That gives you nothing. It really is, like, such an unnecessary thing. Well, it's, I mean, like you said earlier, it's there to be like, don't smoke, kids. But it's yeah. so heavy-handed. It's so cruel because he's the only one who could see the angels. Which also is a reason why they're able to have a lot of smoking in the movie because they make up for him by telling uh, the audience that you could die from cigarettes. But... That's not what kids see. They see all the cool smokers, and yeah. they want to smoke darts too. Of course, I, I also, I also appreciate that. Like, it already sounds like it's a foregone conclusion that he's going to be an angel. Like, he's going to die and go to heaven. So good for him. Yeah, it, that's uh, that's the comeuppance he deserves is becoming an angel and being under God's will for the rest of eternity. All I could think, because like Tony Danza wins the game essentially, right? Like he. It comes down to a full count, two out, top of the ninth, or bottom of the ninth. Angels lead with one run, bases loaded, and it's the final pitch of the game, and everyone inspires Tony Danza, and he throws it, and the guy hits it, but then Tony Danza catches it and wins the game for them. And all I could think was, well, enjoy it, because you're going to die horribly by December. Like, this is it for you, man. You're out of here. I'm sorry. You're done. Yeah, and they keep reinforcing it by him, like, coughing yeah. while he's on the mound. Yeah. <laughs> so you you can't get away from him dying. You, you're you shoved in the face that this man is a dead man walking. Like just he's done. Knowing that, like, next week he's going to go to the doctor, and the doctor's going to go, I'm so sorry, you have six months to live. Your lungs are black as tar, and, like, you're yeah. done. There's nothing we can do for you. It's so – it's such a sad moment. Like, yeah, he won the game, but – this is as high he's this is it for him it's this is the end of his life right here it's oh so depressing yeah the last uh, scene of this movie or maybe the end credits like if you stay around for the credits the scene you Never get will. is him in the doctor's office he gets <laughs> told that he has cancer and is about to die uh -huh. and then he just like puts his uh hands <laughs> in his face and he goes but i won the pennant and then you, you're done <laughs> that's the end of the movie i, I like it's like there's there's a little scene after that where he goes and bangs on Danny Glover's door and he's like, is Joseph Gordon-Levitt here? I need to talk to you about the angels. Can your angels help me get this cancer out of my lungs? Yeah, it's a great setup <laughs> to a sequel. Yeah. Well, no, there is no sequel because Joseph Gordon-Levitt goes, no, I'm sorry. They can't get the cancer out of your lungs. You're just going to you're just going to die. I'm so sorry. I, I knew about it last week, actually, but I didn't want to ruin your pennant win by telling you that you're a dead man walking. I'm so sorry, Tony. Yeah, plus he's happy now. He has a father and a brother and a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, that scene ends with 
Joseph just slowly closing the door in Tony Danza's face while he's on his knees crying, being like, get your angels to save me. And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I, the, the pool is calling. I got to go for a swim. And that's yeah. it. <laughs> I got to beat the heat. <laughs> well, I bet you wish you hadn't been smoking all this time. Oh, well, bye-bye. <laughs> I'm still young. I can smoke. <laughs> yeah. He goes back there. JP's lit up. He's having a dart. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, you might as well keep smoking because you're going to die anyways. Well, exactly. Enjoy your time. You know, enjoy the pennant that you've hung on your wall, which will get taken down and thrown in the trash in six months after you die. And uh, and enjoy those darts because they got you here and you got to dance with the one that brought you. Yeah. Don't change brands at this point. That's oh, for sure. No. Hey. I don't know much about baseball, but, like, would it be possible... So, they're in dead last at the All-Star break. Is there enough time for a team to go from dead last to first place in that in that amount of time? Yes. Wow. The, you could definitely do it. You would have to win a crazy amount of games, but there's 162 games, oh. and even the best teams lose, like, 60 to 70 games in a year. So you could, like, totally turn it around by some miracle. Like but, angels um, helping you. So that's spot on. But again, they would have had to have been on, like, an 80-game losing streak and then after the All-Star break gone on an 80-some game winning streak. <laughs> it's <laughs> absurd. It would go down as the craziest year in baseball. They would. There would never be a year that would – even whoever won the pennant the next year, they'd go, yeah, but, like – do you remember what the Angels did last year? Uh, sorry, Oakland Athletics. It's not as cool. Moneyball is fine, I guess, but these Angels really <laughs> helped them out. Yeah, Moneyball would have probably been shoved under the rug, and we would have never had this analytics age of baseball. Ugh, so ruined baseball. I wish this would have happened based for, on a real story. For real, absolutely, yeah. Oh, also, like, I don't know anything about baseball. I, I feel like I've made that very clear, but... It, is the division championships different from the World Series? Yes. So, a lot of deep fandom in baseball, uh, you know, puts the regular season on a pedestal. Sure. Because you have to grind out 162 games right. to be on top. For a World Series, you kind of just got to get, uh, you know, hot at the right time. Mm. But, like... The league, winning the league and your division is uh, held in higher esteem for a lot of baseball fans. So, them, so because they don't win the World Series at the end of this movie. No. They win their division championships. And there's four divisions in, in the MLB? Well, there's six now. I don't know what there was then. Okay. They've changed a lot of things. So... so I, so I love the idea of them like winning their division championships and then just getting swept in the playoffs by like the Pittsburgh Pirates. Like first first round of the World Series, you're gone. Sorry, the Angels didn't come back and help you with this one. <laughs> yeah, they they another end credit scene that should have been included for sure. Yeah, it's the same thing with Rookie of the Year. Like they the whole movie is about winning the pennant and then like afterwards they win the world series and you see the ring and him uh catching a ball in the outfield but oh. um yeah it's more about the pennant in a lot of these movies which is really weird it was always weird to me when i was a kid but it makes more sense now well does it though it still seems like who cares ultimately like he didn't win everything at the end of the year no one's going to be talking about how the angels won the pennant they're going to be talking about how the pittsburgh pirates won the world series the real fans will. The real Danny Glovers of this sport will know what they're talking about. You know what? Fair enough. When you're right, you're right. And this time, you're absolutely right. Yes, indeed. Now, Adam. Now, Steve. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> you had an angel in your throat there. I was possessed by Christopher Lloyd. I think I have lung cancer. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, can I speak to you now? <laughs> uh, no, you're going to die. <laughs> That's cool. Six months? Ah, six days. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, it's well, a real. What did you think of Angels in the Outfield and returning back to this childhood favorite? Uh, Steve, I loved Angels in the Outfield. It was, uh, it, I get why I liked it as a kid because of all the like it could happen. Like I get it, all the all the kid stuff is fun, all the Angel stuff is wacky, you know, hippie hippie shake and all that. But as an adult, I just loved the cast, and I loved how outrageous it was, and I loved <laughs> an angel telling a child that a grown man is going to suffer and die of lung cancer at the biggest moment of this man's life. 
And now, Steve, what did you think of Angels in the Outfield? Or, as I kept writing, Angles in the Outfield. Well, um, I'm certainly an angle lover, and I'm certainly an angel lover. Uh, I This movie is great. I wore out the tape when I was a kid. Uh, I love when Danny Glover says, great, a psycho kid, <laughs> right in front of him. And, uh, I think Danny Glover is a star. He, yeah. He's the bad of the hour. I do love that two separate people look at the picture of Danny Glover and Joseph Gordon-Levin and go, oh, looks like a prison photo. <laughs> Which, I don't, I don't know what that means, but two separate people say it. Well, they're hot off of Home, Home Alone where they go woof to uh, <laughs> What's-His-Face's girlfriend. So Biff. They, they needed a photo to glom onto. Of course. Fricker is great in this movie, and uh, so is everybody else. Yeah, Walt Disney, you did it again. You did it again. Hey, everyone, thanks for tuning in for spring training. We've got a real real doozy of a plan for May, and we can't wait to share it with you. So uh, until next time, keep fit and have fun. Are we ending it like that? Is that... <laughs> Yeah, keep fit and have fun, I think. Body break. <laughs> da -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. Well, one last time from disgraced baseball announcer, whatever his name is. I made a comment earlier tonight that uh, I guess uh, went out over the air that I, I am deeply ashamed of. If I have hurt anyone out I there, guess. I can't tell you how much I say from the bottom of my heart, I'm so very, very sorry. I pride myself and think of myself as a, a man of faith, as there's a drive in a deep left field by Castellanos, it will be a home run. Play ball! <laughs> I guess it went out over the air, I guess. So flippant.